introduce John Voigt, who will be telling us about computing zeta functions of non-degenerate hypersurface view monomials. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you all for coming to a 3.30 talk on Friday after a long week of writing code. I would apologize even more, except the conference goes on Saturday and Sunday, so we're not even, not even yet getting started. All right, so this is about computing zeta functions. I guess if you're here, you, you too care about computing zeta functions for whatever reason. Um, there, uh, if you were here, I'm assuming most of you, if not all of you, were here for um, Kiran's talk, where he gave a pretty exhaustive summary of classification of the various flavors of zeta functions. Well, I only have 30 minutes, so I'm just going to tell you about my version with a few comments about how it relates. Um, the nice feature about our uh, method is that it, it really takes advantage of those polynomials uh, that have few monomials. Um, I guess you might call those sparse. But sparse has a very particular meaning. And I was told by various computer scientists that the word I should use is funomial, a term coined by Kushnarenko. And I hate that word, funomial. Okay? <laughs> so that's why the title ended up being so long, with few monomials. But, OK, so here we go. I also apologize for doing an old school blackboard talk, but I just kind of conservative that way. OK, so uh, let's write down the basic setup. So let's take a, a Laurent polynomial over FQ. So we'll just we'll call this F bar. I think this is what Jan used to. Ultimately, we'll take a list um, to a characteristic zero. So I'll write all my characteristic T objects with a bar over them. So this will be the sum of a bunch of monomials. So we'll take some new inside e to the n, and the coefficient a new bar, and then x to the new. So I'm using the usual multi-index notation. So nu is an element of v to the n, so it has some components, and then I reach, raise, so this x, if it were, if nu were uh, 1 comma 2, <laughs> and there were just x and y, then it would be x, y squared, something like that. So the efficiency of this kind of notation will really allow me to write down some formulas, because it would otherwise be really complicated. So for example, I'll also write that this is an element of fq um, x plus or minus, so that's another really compact way of writing this Laurent series ring. Okay, so this is just a uh, Laurent polynomial over FQ. Um, let's let P be the characteristic of FQ. And the thing that we are in, so this F naturally cuts out uh, variety. So it's a zero set of F. It's naturally something contained in F star to the n, so we would call this a toric hypersurface because it uh, cuts out a zero locus inside the torus. And there are various ways of completing this inside the toric variety associated to this, but as far as I'm concerned, I just want to count the number of solutions to this equation, um, set it equal to zero, with all the components being non-zero elements of that q. Okay, so we'll consider, so we're all interested in, Let me know when this pen starts to die too badly in the back, and I'll switch it up. So we're interested in the zeta function, which is just the exponential generating series for the number of points uh, as I look over the extensions of f cube. So I take x of sum r equals 1 to infinity, the number of points on this d of x, but over f cube to the n, true to the r, um, t to the r over r. Okay. So this thing is a rational function by a theorem of Dwork, and uh, great. So that's, that's, the, that's the thing that hopefully we're all interested in, and our theorem will be a method to compute this rational function. Um, so I told you that the interesting um, aspect of our algorithm is that it takes advantage of the structure of f in terms of the number of terms that appear there, so let's already um, uh, include that. So let's take, uh, here's how you keep track of that. So we define the support of f just to be the set of monomials where this coefficient is non-zero, z to the n where this coefficient is non-zero. Okay, implicitly, I was already, when I wrote down this polynomial, realizing just those finite infinity terms, but I really need those that are non-zero. And then let's count the number of those guys. So let this guy and s be the number of elements in the support. And I'm going to make an assumption that uh, this 
support. So I'm going to look at what's called the Newton polytope of this support associated to F. So we're going to call the Newton polytope this guy to be the convex hull of this support of F bar. So you take the well, the convex hull in R to the N, um, where you consider these as all the vertices. Okay? And I want the that I mean that convex hull, you could have something horrible like they all live in a line or something like that. Okay? If you have so, an object like that, what you need to do is to change the coordinates of your space and work in a lower dimensional object. So I'm going to assume that this dimension of this delta is always at least n, so you have a full dimensional polytope in a dimensional space, and that's more or less without loss of generality. As a result of that, as just like um, in order to get a triangle in the plane, you need three points, um, that means that this support is always at least n plus 1. So you need n plus 1 points in n dimensional space to get a full dimensional polytope. This s will turn out to be uh, something in the running time of our algorithm, a parameter. So already you need to know that it's at least n plus 1. All right. So now there's a notion of uh, smoothness. Um, you might ask, how hard is it to compute the zeta function? Well, if you phrase the terms in this level of generality, it's extremely hard. It's harder than the NP-complete problem 3SAT, which um, just asks the question if a Boolean expression um, is satisfiable or not, which is not even computing the zeta function. It's just asking if the number of points over F2 is greater than 0 or not. All right? So there's no possibility at least uh, as long as p is not equal to np, for us to have really good algorithms for computing this full zeta function. So that's a very hard problem. So usually one restricts to some interesting set of families. And for us, at the very least, we need to impose a smoothness condition on this polynomial f. Okay, so our smoothness condition is called non-degeneracy. So here's how this goes. I think uh, um, this already showed up in Karan's talk and it explains some aspects of it, but I just want to make sure that it's really the same. So I need one piece of notation. So if I take a face, tau inside of delta, I'm going to denote by f restricted to tau. Just if I take tau, it's a face inside delta, I take only those monomials that live in tau. So this is the sum of a nu bar x to the nu, where nu lives in tau. I mean, for example, if I restrict it to delta, that's just the whole thing again. Okay? So I mean for Okay, so we say that f is non-degenerate if it's smooth, but more importantly, um, it's smooth in the torque variety in the sense that the intersection with every torus that you get when you glue together the torque variety, um, the intersection is always of co-dimension 1. So there's a, there's a really nice way of saying that, which is, you say, for all faces tau inside delta, including delta itself, the set of equations where you take f restricted to tau <coughs> and all of its partial derivatives. So you take x1, well, the, the derivatives in the torus, partial f, partial x1, restricted to tau, and so on, xn, partial f, restricted to tau, partial xn. If I ask, what are the set of, so f is non-degenerative for every tau, you check the set of solutions to this equation. You can see why this is like a smoothness. If I just took the regular derivative, I would be describing the Jacobian variety of, say, a plane uh, curve or something like that. So I'd say there's no solution. So it has no solution in fq bar star to the n. Okay, so this is for all for all faces. And this bar, which is the algebraic closure of fq, is not the same as the bar which denotes characteristics of p, but at least this could point that out. OK, so um, that we're going to look at non-degenerate um, guys. So what did, what did you learn from Piran about non-degenerate um, polynomials? <coughs> uh, how, how severe of a, of a condition is it to say, for example, that something so if, if you look at a space of uh, polynomials, Laurent polynomials, with a given Newton polytope. Aside from some important counterexamples, this is a Zariski open condition. So you're really imposing one single condition. There's a delta discriminant, just like the, it's like eliminating the not smooth plane curves in a family of, of uh, plane curves. So it's really a Zariski open condition. So a, a generic choice of them will satisfy this. OK? So, um, all right, great. So I need to set up a little bit more notation, and then I'll tell you the, the result, a result in terms of with, with these hypotheses. All right, so the 
I'll, I'll tell you one immediate uh, result that we get uh, by imposing non-degeneracy. So if you have non-degeneracy, then the zeta function has a very nice form. So if I take zeta of f bar, qt, so I just take the zero locus of this f, I make a slightly a strange change of variables, and I call it q times t, but there's a reason for that. It relates to the way that the zeta function is computed in terms of exponential sums. This thing will at least to the minus 1 to the n, so it or its, the, it, its inverse. This thing is a polynomial. If you can believe it, a polynomial of degree, of some degree. So this degree is, I call v, and it's called v because it's the normalized volume of this um, polytope delta. Okay. So what does the n factorial do? Well, it means this volume is going to be an integer. For example, if you take something with, um, if you just take a simplex, so something where of n plus uh, n plus one things, you look at the determinant, and the determinant is one, then the volume is also one. So it's much more. Otherwise, it's like one over n factorial um, in the usual. Um, measure. So it's this thing times a bunch of other factors, which you would call the trivial factors or otherwise ignored when you have the um, hyperplane theorem. So it, explicitly in this case, it's the zeta function of the torus. And this thing you also have to take to the minus 1 to the n. So in other words, there's th this of course doesn't depend on anything. It's a bunch of binomial coefficients and 1 minus q's and things like that. So it's something you can complete completely separately, and then this is the piece that you're interested in. So this non-degeneracy condition tells you what degree it is in general. And this is a really fun thing, even for plane curves. It tells you something like if you take a general Laurent polynomial and you ask about its um, what is its genus, well, the genus is going to be double that. It's going to be the degree of this interesting piece of cohomology. And that you can compute um, also by just counting the interior lattice points of your polygon. So there, there are a lot of really um, fast computational techniques that you're allowed to apply. Okay. So um, I told you that the sparsity will enter in our running time, so I just have a bit of notation for that. So let's let, um, I'm going to write down a matrix U. U is the n plus 1 by S matrix um, with columns. So each column is of the form one new for each new in the support of f bar. Okay, so maybe it's very natural to just take. The, you're just writing down the columns where I record all of the exponents of that occur in this this polygon, this uh, polynomial f bar. I have to add this one, and there's all sorts of reasons why it's like a, a hom homogenizing variable with respect to the code over this, which, which shows up in, in the theory in a particular way. So it has uh, n plus 1 rows, n being the number of variables here, plus the 1, and then it has s columns corresponding to each one of the elements in the support there. Okay? So let's let a row be the rank of this guy. Okay? But I don't actually care about this full rank. This is a matrix with integer entries, because the, I'm just recording the exponents of monomials. I care about the rank of this matrix mod p. OK, I guess you could read that in two ways. I mean, take the matrix, you reduce it mod p, and then ask for its rank. OK? That rank is, I guess, well, generically, you would expect it to be um, equal to n plus 1. But I guess it could be much, um, much bigger. Much less, I'm sorry, much less. All right. So there's uh, one other thing I want to talk about, which is confined, but I think maybe I'll just skip that and tell you the our theorem. Okay. So for the purposes of this theorem, the interesting case is where n, the number of variables, is fixed, and s, the number of elements in the support, is also fixed. Those enter into the we we did the analysis of the algorithm much more generally, but uh, that's the kind of family that you might assume. Someone. I can take an arbitrary degree, but I have to fix the dimension, and I have to fix the number of monomials for which I like to take them. So maybe you take a family of varieties, and you just let the degree go to infinity, or you take some monomial deformation, but it doesn't matter what the characteristic of those monomials are. They could be mixed. They could have weird exponents. That, that doesn't matter. What matters is the number of them. Okay. So let's fix that right at, at the outset. So let n be 
an integer at least one, and s be an integer, which is at least n plus one. So it's going to be the number of uh, elements in the support. Okay, so then there's this algorithm. that given um, input, one of these non-degenerates of f bar, which is an f q of x plus or minus, I have to do one thing, so I have to now put a few hypotheses on them. The first one is that p has to be at least 3. Okay, so p is equal to 2 might be interesting for you cryptographers out there. We actually have a genuine reason to avoid p is equal to 2, not that we're lazy. We sat down, tried to write down a robo ring instead to get the right amount of convergence, but there's something with the denominator p minus 1, and p minus 1 when p is equal to 2 is 1, and that screws up all of the convergence of the things that we need. So it's really, we re genuinely don't know how to deal with p is equal to 2. Okay, so we take p is at least 3, um, with p is equal to 3, non-degenerate. And there's one other thing I need, which is confined. So I'll come back and tell you what confined means. It has to do with how bad the monomials could be. Now, running time only depends on the volume. But in general, you could have a poly polytope, which is heavily skewed in one direction, has absolutely enormous um, exponents that occur. But in fact, after a change of variables, it would be something very small. So you could be very contorted in order to do that. Confined says you want the monomials to live inside a box of some dimension. Of, of some size, which only depends on n. So I'll come back to that. But most, most interesting cases, you can always reduce to a, to a confined case. So this is the one where otherwise you have to add some big O factors that depend on the sizes of the exponents, which is kind of ugly. OK, so there exists an algorithm that, given this as input, computes the zeta function. And of course, what you want to know is how long it takes. And here's the running time. OK, so there's O tilde. That tilde means I can ignore logarithmic terms in the things that appear. So there's some log logs that I don't want to think about. So here it is, pv cubed log to the fourth cube plus p to the s minus rho, v to the s plus 5, log to the s plus 3 cubed, bit upper. How legible are my exponents in the back? Good enough? OK, hope so. All right, so the interesting thing about this method is that the running time really does depend on the number of monomials that appear. And I guess you would believe that in general anyway. In practice, when we heard Jan talk about when you take something that's sparse, then in practice, the running time is a lot less. So we're taking it up one notch and saying, we're actually going to use this sparseness in the way that the algorithm runs and then we can bound the running time that way directly. Okay, So that is our result. How good is that in comparison to other things, you might ask? That's a good question. Um, first of all, what's the output size? What's the input and what's the output size? Well, uh, the output size is going to be this polynomial, or inverse polynomial, of degree v. It has integer coefficients. And Karan discussed that there's essentially a Riemann hypothesis that tells you how big these coefficients are in general. So if you run that, then the output size is, well, it's OK. I'll put a tilde here, too. So it's v squared log q. Okay, so it's a polynomial of degree v. And each coefficient, you can bound to have a number of bits required to write them as v log q. That's actually a huge kind of overestimated that assumes the worst case. So that's even, um, I mean, it's like a binomial coefficient in terms of how many Qs you can get. OK? So what about these other terms that appear here? Well, it looks like I'm doing pretty good. If s is fixed, then you know this is a constant it, that I, I fixed once and for all. So that means it's nice and polynomial in terms of this. So this is also fixed. And the interesting terms then are, well, I guess it's only in the power of p where you might wonder what happens. OK? So in the best possible case, you have s minus rho is equal to 0, and then this part p doesn't show up at all. Okay? So there's a remark here that says that if, right, 
if s is equal to n plus 1. Okay, can that ever happen? Well, you have to remember what this rho is. Rho is the rank of an n plus 1 by s matrix. Okay, well, I guess s could be n plus 1. So you could take, for example, a simplex inside there. Um, that it'll necessarily, it doesn't have to have determinant 1 when I look at the column vectors, but some, some scaled simplex. And you ask just that that thing has uh, actual rank n plus 1. So you don't get some weird thing when you reduce it mod p. So that'll certainly hold for all but finitely many p if you fix something over um, the integers, for example. So if s is equal to n plus 1, then the contribution of the power of p goes away. It remains here, which is kind of a bummer. I think uh, uh, Kiran also talked about the exponential in p problem and how that relates to other things. You, 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 I got to tell you, this p really shouldn't be there either. So you want to know where it shows up? So if s is equal to n plus 1 and there's an oracle to compute factorials, mod powers of p, that's all I need, then this p totally goes away. So if and there's an algorithm, to compute factorials mod p to the n. So here n is the, the precision needed to recover the zeta function, which in this level of generality looks like nv mod q. The n doesn't even matter there because we're considering it's a constant inside that. I just wanted to state that for emphasis. So if you can compute factorials mod p to the n, then the running time is everything, this p, this factor p, goes away. And the running time is exactly this thing. p to the s minus rho, v to the s plus 5, log to s plus 3 plus p. So in, I have to give you some running time here. So let's say it's no harder to compute factorials um, than it is to multiply things uh, mod p to the capital N. Okay, so in general, that would take um, the number of bits required one of those things down would be um, n mod p, and I'm saying it's no worse than multiplying those, those things. Um, computer scientists do this all the time. They, they pretend like there's an oracle to solve one thing, and then they do the running time um, for that. So in this, for example, you might have an algorithm that has to factor an integer or to factor a polynomial mod p, and those are well-studied problems and they're well-known bounds. So here, I'm spotlighting that if there was a fast way to compute factorials mod powers of p, then the running time is, um, well, I guess I'm taking s equals n plus 1. And I want this, OK. I guess everything is still OK here. But just to highlight uh, the point here, let's make s equals n plus 1 is equal to rho. And then this term goes away. And then this is, is polynomial time in the output side. So um, you, it's a little, uh, it's very distressing for someone like me who spent a lot of time thinking about piatic point counting algorithms and you learn the theory of work, and at the end of the day, you're stuck in your running time analysis because you can't compute factorials very fast. So um, please help if you have any <laughs> ideas about how to do that. That would speed up a lot of algorithms. And even uh, one of uh, Dave Harvey's main contributions is to recognize that uh, the, if you want to compute a bunch of these factorials, mod higher and higher powers of p, well, if you can reuse calculations from one mod p towards the other, because if you know the factorials as an integer, you can use them in other ones. And that allows you to get things like average polynomial time. And here I'm just spotlighting. The only thing I need to make that go in the dwarf theory in this uh, special case where the monomials is, <coughs> the number of those monomials is heavily constrained is, uh, is just the factorials themselves. Okay, so certainly um, the balanced remainder trees, so the, the thing that uh, Kiran mentioned, would allow you to do things like compute the, the, L, the Hasse-Vey L function, if you take something that's fine over a number field, of one of these guys in <coughs> average function. So the, the same ideas will work there. OK. Well, but what if you, the p s minus rho, that might be p squared, for example, right? How do you get an average for a normal time? Well, OK, I made this, I made this hypothesis. I guess. Right. So I, I no. in general, so I, one, one p, right? If you have two p's, then you cannot get rid of the right. one. As soon as, that's right, this is a very, very special case. In general, as soon as s is bigger than rho, then that, you can't get away with the factorial. So you might ask yourself, what kinds of families of varieties have n plus 1 monomials and n variables? Does anyone actually even care about things like that? Well, already the dwarf family is a good one, and you can take deformation, so that there, there are lots of things. 
And I guess you also mentioned the possibility of using this as a starting point for a deformation. So if you have a problem where deforming to the Fermat hypersurface is not as uh, elegant, but instead it naturally deforms to some other thing, we'll choose your favorite n plus 1 monomials that occur in that thing, compute the zeta function there in polynomial time or average polynomial time, and then use a deformation method um, to get from one member of that family to the other. Which you cannot do in a deformable time. Which you can't do yet. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. So factorials up to what? I mean, of, of what size? Are you trying to compute more? Because oh, well, certainly they, they cycle back after a while, right? So I'm being a little bit vague. Um, I guess I don't really, <coughs> I don't need anything bigger than p to the n factorial. After that, that's zero anyway, right? So then that's easy to compute, and any factorial bigger than that will also be zero. Okay, so that's the, I think that's still okay. But like I tell you explicitly, uh, there's a formula for the Frobenius, and I tell you exactly which factorials occur. It's like I need the exponential function, but I need the p-adic exponential, and I need certain pieces. Yeah. I asked this uh, rather surreptitiously as a problem on the math overflow. You want to know the answer that I got? This sounds like something that would be useful in piatic cohomology, and it's a really hard problem, so you're, you know, you're out of luck. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't even able to hide this problem. <laughs> Very yeah. devastating. But yeah, so think about computing p minus 1 factorial mod p squared. Already, if you can do that quickly, that shows up in Bernoulli numbers and all kinds of things. You can do that kind of thing. Probably the same ideas will allow us to, to do it. So the great thing about this algorithm is not constrained to a particular, uh, the geometry doesn't really matter. The dimension also doesn't as long as it's fixed. All I care about is the number of polynomials, and I'm going to do some weird combinatorics with the polytope. That kind of thing. OK, good. Probably by now I've used up all my time. Great. Um, so how much of this do you want to know about? All of it. <laughs> You say that, but you don't mean it. Um, okay, I guess, uh, so you said, can I have five or ten more minutes? Oh, sure. sure. Okay. So I'll, 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 what I'll try to do is to give you the sense of what is, uh, how it goes without any of the horrible formulas, which can really turn people off. But before I do, are there any other questions about, uh, so what's good about our algorithm is the sparsity and the fact that it has wide applicability. The bad thing is, it's the power of p is probably not competitive yet, uh, and the way, and th with uh, any of the other classes that you're interested in. But maybe over time we'll return to this. Unless until we can really use it in deformation, um, I'm not sure that it will be good for a dense input either. If that's the kind of thing you're really interested in. But for certain classes, um, like the ones that show up in mirror symmetry or some of the heavily um, studied ones, they tend to be sparse because that increases the number of symmetry they have, and so then you want to use that here. Okay, great. So what I decided, all right, so I'll tell you um, how it works. So the way that it works is more cohomology. Okay, so as a very, very broad overview, there is a space, which is just a vector space. I call it each n plus 1 omega, it's a complex, it's a homology of a complex that I'm not going to write down, it's not important. This is a finite dimensional vector space over a p-adic field k. Okay? The p-adic field, I might as well just think about it as being qp for the purposes of understanding what's going on. Okay? So this finite dimensional vector space is a quotient of two infinite dimensional vector spaces. So this thing is the quotient of a p-adic power series ring. in n plus 1 variables. And this is the dagger. As, as Jan presaged, every one of these theories there is a dagger. And this is a dagger ring, of some convergent power series. It's not important in, a, in the negative 10 minutes that I have to tell you exactly what that is. So this is over a p-adic field k. Okay. And you take quotient by the image, images under n plus 1 differential operators. Okay. And these are almost the same as the operators here, where you take the derivative and then you multiply by the x1. That preserves the property of belonging to the polytope and things, things like that. Um, but uh, there, you have to change them slightly in order to get in, in the dwarf theory. Okay, so I'm, I'm just going to be vague, given this, this sense. 
Um, actually, if you, since this is a p-adic power series ring, the coefficients converge. And so if you only care about, say, what this vector space looks like over fp, it does have a notion of a good reduction. <laughs> and then you really just want to know about a certain Jacobian ring, and that tells you what the basis for this ring is. So the first step in this algorithm is to find a basis, and that involves uh, some linear algebra where you take to write down the possible monomials that occur, then you hit them with the differential operators coming from lower degree, and you sort all of that out as uh, using you know, linear algebra over FQ. That's not so bad. In fact, these really start, you can start out getting a sense of what the basis looks like by just taking the interior lattice points of the original polytope. That's actually a good way to think about what these things look like. So it's the kind of thing you can really write down. But you have to, you have to take the, uh, the certain scaled multiples of the polytope and then intersect with some differential operators. So it's slightly more complicated, but that's what this thing looks like. Okay? This vector space has an action of the Frobenius such that a Lefschetz formula applies. In other words, if you want to count the number of points, you just have to count the number of fixed points of this Frobenius. More generally, the characteristic pol uh, polynomial of Frobenius tells you exactly what this polynomial of degree v equals uh, and plus n factorial times the volume, okay? So this thing is a k vector space of dimension v when the poly polynomial f bar is non-degenerate. And that's why the zeta function is the polynomial because the characteristic polynomial of Frobenius acting on this vector space is the number of, of, number of points. It tells you what's in the, the zeta function. So um, how do these algorithms work? Well, you first you compute a basis. Okay, so I just told you how to do that, very roughly speaking. You want to look at interior lattice points. That requires some combinatorics. And, well, happily, there are a lot of algorithms out there for working explicitly with polytopes. Okay? What do you have to do then? Well, you have to hit them with some Frobenius, which is slightly horrible. And then, now it's just some element in a huge power series ring. You want to reduce it to see what it actually gives. So this is supposed to be represented by a v by v matrix for which we could compute the characteristic polynomial. Well, you do that modulo some precision, capital N, enough so that you can recover this polynomial given bounds on the size of the coefficients, which are already implicit when I said um, this. So this is the approximate precision that you would need in order to recover the coefficients. And once you do that, well, you just need to see, use an explicit reduction theory, which boils down to multiplying by matrices. So you have some elements, you know what its image is under differential operators, so you multiply by matrices to bring, the, bring them down. So that's in general how these um, phiatic point counting methods work. Um, I'll tell you the interesting features about dwarf cohomology that make it different than Monty Washner co uh, cohomology. These, uh, this, um, well, first of all, it's very easy to write down this basis. I guess in general you can do that with Monty Washner. The Frobenius is um, in the case where there aren't that many monomials it's super easy to write down. That's actually the one thing that allows the running time to depend only on s and the number of monomials. In general, if you have a power series ring in n plus one variables, you start with one little guy and you hit it with a Frobenius. Well, it's gonna be some polynomial of uh, 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 multi-degree given by the precision that you need. And so the number of terms is gonna grow like big O of p to the n. And in fact, when you do operations, you're gonna get things like p to the two n that show up in the running time. So the extra advantage that we squeeze out is by giving a simpler way to write down this Frobenius, which is more direct. Okay? Um, that's my overview of dwarf cohomology. I've given some of the worst talks in my life by actually trying to say more about this. And even with an hour, it just gets worse. Um, maybe what uh, would be interesting is if I did one simple example to show you the flavor of the formulas, um, and then I'll shut up. Okay. So here's, here's an example that you don't need this theory for, but it, I think it will make it very clear what's going on. Okay, so let's take this guy. Okay, so these mi are just integers. Let's take them to be positive integers to be clear. And the non-degeneracy condition is just the product of these coefficients that I took is not equal to zero, okay? So I would call this a uh, generalized Fermat equation. So that probably means something to people who study modular forms. It's like I'm not requiring all of the m's to be equal. 
If I did that, then I could make it homogeneous and it would be the Fermat equation. For this purpose, actually, it's not even important that they're like, um, it's only the variable x1 that appears to a certain power. What I'm just doing this to show you what it looks like. In general, you can just take any of these. So this is n plus 1 variables, uh, n plus 1 monomials, and n variables, exactly this optimal condition for the, for the statement of the theorem. And so you should think about these monomials as just being any of them sprinkled inside the n-dimensional space. So this is the cleanest one to show. Okay? That gives you a sense of the, the scope of how the algorithm works. So the number of points on these families, why else consider it? Well, this is the one that was originally worked out by Vey when he was first uh, proposing his theory in cohomology. And you, the number of points is really like a Jacobi sum, which is, can be related to a Gauss sum, just because the, when you look at the number of points, the variables all separate out. So you can really write it purely in those terms. But we don't want to just count points. We want to know the whole zeta function. And I want to show you how the formulas work so that if it's not perfect cross terms, you have a sense of what, how it would work. OK? So there's one other thing I need for non-degeneracy, which maybe you would have guessed from this, is that I need p to not divide m1 up through n. OK, so if p divides one of those variables, when I take a derivative, the p is equal to 0. And that gives me a problem when I look at the derivatives. Okay? In general, if you want to relax this assumption, um, Adelson and Sperber have a notion of uh, non-degenerate with respect to a lattice, um, so that you can say the sort of the natural lattice that it wants to belong to are those with multiples of p in one variable, and then the theory actually carries through pretty nicely. So even this is a, a stronger restriction than what you really need to get going. Okay, so here's how it goes. So you let f be the type in your root. So this thing now lives in z q x. And I remove all of the bars from the, the coefficients. This just means I, this is a necessarily a q minus first root of unity, because it's non-zero. And I lift it to the element of z q, which is the extension of z p given by the roots of unity that are contained inside of q, where it actually is a root of unity there. So that's a typical thing and not too hard to compute, though apparently 10,000 times as hard to compute in stage than in magvi, if you know that before it comes. OK, so this delta, which is since left us, is just the convex hull of these monomials. And here you just have to take the coordinates. So you have m1, 0 up to 0, and then you have up through nn, and then you have the 0 guy corresponding to this thing. So that looks like, um, like a piece of an orthotope, like a, like a, not necessarily a simplex, but a, a higher dimensional triangle. I don't know, what are those things called? All right, I can't draw a picture other than saying, you know, this is what it looks like in dimension two. Okay. So what's this cohomology space? So this cohomology space here, maybe I'll just call it V. This V, naturally you can write it as a sum from D is equal to zero up to N of some, in degree, so there's like a degree D piece and the degree goes from zero up to N. Um, and the degree d piece looks like this. So there's a dwarf pi sitting around, but it's a. So I'll show you what these monomials look like anyway. So there's a factor here which is a, let's call it a dummy variable. This dummy variable is called pi times w, and it just records the degree. So you might think of this as just being remembering that this particular monomial lives in a degree which I've called d. So these mu's are the interesting things, and I want them to live b between d minus 1. And then I take the dot product of 1 over m and mu, and I want that to be between, be between d minus 1 and d. So this is the dot product. Okay, so m, remember, I'm just putting all of those vectors together. So this would just be m1 over u1 over m1 plus dot to dot up to mu n over mn, and I want that to be, to be between d minus 1 and d. In general, to compute something like this, like I said, you have to do a bit of linear algebra over FQ to write things down. So this is naturally a subset of this uh, ring. So I take, uh, I don't know, delta um, intersect the z. If I want to take the infinite multiples of delta and intersect them with z. So in degree d, so this goes from d to infinity, and then I do z q of, and then I take d delta and intersect it with z. So I think uh, Kiran wrote something down like this. Just imagine you take your polytope and you scale it by d, and I take the integer lattice points there. That gives me a ring. The multiplication is just given by adding um, the exponent. So that's what this 
that's how you write down the basis of the space and what it looks like in this particular case. Okay? Yeah, okay. Is it alright if I raise the stage days? So given your familiarity with uh, reduction, probably the interesting piece is what does Frobenius really look like when I hit one of these guys with a Frobenius? What does it look like? Well, it turns to an element in, so this monomial is just a monomial inside this, this weird power series space. And when you hit it with uh, Frobenius, you get something pretty intense. But here's how it goes. You remember this uh, matrix U that I wrote down, which is ones upon the top, and then I write down the, in each column the coordinates, the exponents of the vectors. So in this case, it would just be m1, 0, m2, 0, and on the way up to mn, 0. And then the last one I have, maybe I'll make it the first one, corresponding to this b, sorry, which I've hidden. So that's just the, the origin as a last point. So here's what the Frobenius looked like. It's pretty intense. Um, first of all, I have, I have to write down a bit of data, and this will show you what I mean by um, taking advantage of the combinatorics of the new project. So this is a very simple um, n plus 1 by n plus 1 matrix. And what I need actually is just its inverse mod p. So I'm going to write down a particular, so given a vector mu inside z to the n, it's enough to take only the positive ones because I've taken an affine equation really here um, and to, get the to pick out an interesting piece in cohomology. So given one of these mu's, I write down a particular vector which I call k mu. And this k mu is given by m inverse times mu. Maybe I'll just write times so that's clear. And uh, so I'm going to write this as mod p. Okay. So the condition that, I, that p does not divide any of the m's means this is an invertible matrix mod p. I write down the smallest representative of those coefficients as non-negative integers, and that gives me a matrix which I call n inverse. It's the property that it is the inverse mod p, and I've just chosen the smallest integer representatives of that matrix. And then I just multiply it by mu, which is a vector. So I'll write it like, maybe just to be clear, it's like 1 mu, something like that. So here's what the Frobenius looks like. Um, I'll call this, I'll just, okay, I'll write Frobenius of pi w v x to the mu. We'd like to see where, what that looks like. Well, um, here's what it looks like. If you uh, just carry, all right, I'll, I'll write out the expansion and then I'll show you what the, the reduction here gives you. So it looks like this. Okay, I'm going to have to write down one horrible formula for you and then you'll be so glad that I did not write down anymore. You might even be a little upset that I'm writing down one to begin with. But. pretty bad. Okay, so here I took this mu, and then I wrote this k, and that's the k of mu here. If I take absolute value, I just mean sum the, co you know, sum, sum the vector that I get by taking the k out. So what's sigma? Sigma is a list of Frobenius to zq. What's the a? The a is just the monomial given by taking the powers of a1 up through an, given by the exponents k1 up through kn. So this is a product of, Frobe of uh, type mu listings, just some elements of zq. Now I have some fixed power of p that comes from the degree that I picked here and this k, and I've divided it by um, the over p. That's always necessarily a multiple of p. That's how the Frobenius is more or less defined. And this tells me some power of p, which just comes out in the front. Then there's this dummy variable. And then again, a, a certain monomial, which is just given by um, k times nu plus mu. Mu is this thing that I got here. Um, nu um, also has a definition in terms of mu. It's, uh, uh, maybe not important to get into here. And this is, again, a dot product. So here I have some monomial in the xi's. And all of that is just given by, well, I guess you need this linear algebra, and I need to be able to compute those dot products. Okay, and then I have a huge term here, which looks infinite. 
So I take these all, these are all E's, so it'd be better to write it like this. Z n greater or equal to zero to the n. Right, so I just want to write to sum over non all uh, integer entries, where all the entries are non-negative. And then I have an expression here. Now the first thing you notice is that the power of p depends on the sum of the entries there. So I can go out in this n-dimensional space. If I only want to know what this Frobenius is modulo a particular power of p, I can just crop this sum given by the, that exponent there. And I just have to sum the right number of monomials um, up to that point. And then I have some coefficients here. This a to the e I explained here, so it's still multinomial coefficients. There's a dummy variable, and then again a dot product here. Okay. So what are these L's? This is where the factorials show up. So this hopefully will answer um, Avinov's question. These L's are given as follows. So I take and I write down a, this, this function, which is called the dwarf splitting function. Here, pi to the p minus 1 is minus p. And I write this guy as the sum, i equals 0 to infinity, of pi to the i, l i, p to the i. So if there was no t to the p here, this would just be the usual exponential function. But there would be p's in the denominator. If you subtract off t to the p, then these coefficients are actually always in zp. But the power of this pi that shows up, which is necessary to, to get the splitting, tells me that these li's actually live in qp, necessarily. So these are just given by factorials. And I, I mean, if this were just the exponential, it would literally be 1 over n factorial. And it's so close to that, this, this uh, converges very, I mean, this, there's a p here. So p is very large. We almost don't even see those contributions in the range that we're computing. Okay? So what coefficient do we need here? Well, I'm again using multi-index notation in the, in the subscript. So here, I'm, depending on the entries of k and this e, I'll need a several of those factorials. Okay, so does that answer your question, Evanoff, maybe a little bit? Is there, I, I just need to be able to compute this exponential once and for all. So you really can reuse that mod p or mod other as, as p increases. It, those coefficients almost don't change. They do um, given this factor. Okay, so that looks pretty bad, huh? All right, so once you have an expression like this, then I'll tell you um, reduction. So this reduction, which is how you take this under uh, images under n plus 1 differential operators, so I have a condition like this. So here's what the reduction steps look like in this simple example. If I have a variable of uh, an exponent like this here, so let's say I want to reduce something like this in cohomology. Well, the powers of p don't get any worse. So I really could have cropped that exactly there, and then you'll see I don't lose any precision in the reduction steps. So this is congruent to something, uh, mu i minus m i over ai pi w to the d minus 1 x to the mu xi to the minus mi when whenever the mu i is greater than or equal to the mi. That's the last, actually the last thing I write down. Okay? So if I have a weird exponent out here, I'm sorry, I've used d and mu again, but you should think about it now if we have an expression like this and we want to reduce it. Take one of these monomials. Well, let's see how big the degree is and the power of x's. Well, if I ever have an xi to some higher power than mi, so I pick that particular exponent, I just drop the power here and the power that occurs to the xi. In fact, that really gives me like a, almost like a factorial expression for what that coefficient is, because I just keep dropping all the powers of x1, all the x2, x3, and put them all together into one expression. So in this case, there's actually just a formula that's pretty horrible, that, but looks like a hypergeometric formula for the expansion of Frobenius. And you just derive that by actually carrying out the dwarf theory. And if you do the same thing where you change the exponents here to not be these nice orthogonal ones, but other ones, you just get more slightly more complicated uh, reduction, but it's still something you can really write down. Right? So the thing that happens more generally is that if your convex hull is more complicated, you'll get a more complicated matrix here, mu. And it's not enough to just solve for the inverse, but you have to sum over the kernel of this matrix u mod p. And that gives you more terms that are necessary to sum here. And that's why the running time would then be exponential in p. So you're really using the sort of invertibility of this matrix to write down expansion for the Frobenius. 
And then this is more or less the standard technique about how you do that reduction. Okay, thank you very much for your time. Any questions? So you tried it on some examples? Uh, yes. Small ones or big ones? Yeah, I did some curves and surfaces. So we worked out the case of an elliptic curve right away. And OK, it wasn't competitive with the best algorithms there. But it was like log, uh, there's a p and then a log p to the 6. The best ones are like quadratic or cubic. So then we tried some other interesting families where the number of monomials is uh, and s equals n plus 1. Mm -hmm. So we did these. These, there's just a formula for them. So you can kind of see, see how they work. The other family that we found was interesting was uh, the Gaber hypersurfaces. So those have degree p, but they're non-degenerate, um, so they, which are also kind of an interesting case to work out. And then I did a few numerical examples too, which is probably your actual question. And um, at the time when I tried them, so this was work I did when I was a postdoc at IMA, uh, neither Sage nor Magma had the toric piatic things that I needed in order to get going. And so although I had answers, they, there was no point in comparing them to other methods. I think maybe now the right thing to do is to maybe focus on this case where the number of monomials is really equal to n plus 1 in the hope that we can use it in a deformation. And, uh, and that's actually why I'm here this weekend, is to see if we can work out that case and if it's at all competitive with some of the other methods. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. yeah. Nothing's really done. I guess that in the complexity you do have something like d to the n squared, right? If you take the simplex of d by d by d and the projective hypersurface of the d. That's the output size, so you're never going to be able to do better than that. No, no, d to the n squared, I'm saying d to the n is the output size. Not d to the n squared. Uh, okay, you want to so see the output size again. So you're asking about this term, or? No, the, like the complexity? Yeah. The, the yeah. Uh, yeah. So the v to the s plus 5, s was at least n plus 1. Yes. And v is about d to the n, huh? The That's point. right. So it's d to the n squared. Correct. Like here on this AKR thing. Yes. That's right. So, so even in the best case, it's going to be d to the n squared. Well, the information is d to the n to the constant. That's right. That's right. The output size kind of looks like this. It's a polynomial degree v. And ours is, it's, I think it's, good, it's exponential in the dimension. That's right. So the, the no, but it should be. D to the n is also exponential in D. But it's D to the n squared. That's right. The, the exponent for the thing is in terms of the output size. It, that depends on the dimension, yeah. Right. And I would say that uh, the only, I was, there were two ways in which we were doomed that way. One of them is this expansion of the Frobenius where you, you should expect the P to the 2n. And then another one in the reduction where you have certain things of a certain size and you have to bring them back down. We're able to solve one of those problems, which is why, um, you know, there's only this p to the s minus rho in terms of writing down the mm -hmm. But actually, for the other one, it's a power series ring in n plus one variables, and so that's that is more or less why. Um, if and, it's and are, were you really careful with these complexity estimates? Are you? I think so, but already I didn't have a an e in them like you did, so I don't. You're like fast mul matrix multiplication. Oh no, I assume those were cubic. Yes, so you could probably get it down. Quite so you could probably get it down. But yeah, by one or two. Words. I think so. I think so. And uh, there's also a thing that states that it's log q to the four, for example, or all, 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 all other things are always log q to the three, right? Yeah, I'm sure that's because I'm not using fast multiplication yeah, right. uh, inside FQ. So I wouldn't take maybe the four very seriously and the five and the yeah. three. But the general, I was worried more about the, I mean, as long as you're exponential in n and just these powers of p are there, mm -hmm. um, maybe the running time in practice is either going to be a lot worse than this or a lot better, and we'll have to, we'll have to see where, how it goes. Um, but uh, that would, um, yeah, I'm not sure how to it. Yeah, I think, I think there are, and there are probably some theoretical um, improvements that can be made too. There's the p minus 1 factorial, um, which can be done in square root p time by using just a recurrence relation. So David has used that. And it's possible then that maybe this is not p to the s minus rho, but like square root p, mm -hmm. for example. Um, and certainly this p2 you could make into a square root. So there, there are, I don't know, this is just really a, a starting point for that. Um, but I guess the major limitations are in this, in this Frobenius formula. As long as you're doing something, you know, with power series and n plus 1 variables, the size of the thing that you're going to write down 
is going to have to have exponential in it. So you have to do that once, and then maybe by deformation you get to you can bring that complexity down to soft linear in the output size. But I don't expect that we'll be able to do it directly this way. That's a good question. Anything else? Okay. Well, let's thank Thanks John again. Thanks.